begin to study the last chapter of this book, and as Kyle has said, we've been kind of going through this book steadily over the course of time, as is our method in Calvary Chapel to kind of cover the whole of a book, to see what the heart of God is on a particular topic is one thing, and, and that's perfectly valid, but to hear his heart about everything uh, is even richer, so we like to get everything that he has to say to us out of the book of the Bible that we're in, and that's Revelation. So Revelation 22, we enter it today. It is my intention either next Sunday or the Sunday thereafter to close out the book, and so we would then complete our study in the book of Revelation. And Lord willing, if he tarries, uh, we will then continue on into the book or the epistle uh, to the Corinthians, the first Corinthians is where we're going next. So you can kind of read ahead if you want. You could look ahead and uh, prepare your heart and mind for that study as we go on. Um, so today, let's read Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5, and then we'll kind of make our way, giving comment on it. And, um, and at, at the following our, our time in God's Word, we will then have a time of communion. So we'll, that's why I'm only taking five verses today. That'll provide a little bit extra time or cushion at the, end of our, uh, at the end of the service today to provide for communion. So uh, wonderful to be with all of you uh, today and uh, enjoy his presence and his word and, and partake in communion together. So Revelation 22 verses 1 through 5 says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And so as we've kind of been looking at this, what is called the eternal state, uh, that is heaven, where, we, where every child of God, where we eventually will all end up in heaven with God and each other, um, we've been looking at it since the start of Revelation chapter 21. And so far, the, the Lord has shown us the new heavens and the new earth. He's introduced that to us. He's introduced God's kingdom, his eternal kingdom to us. And then he's introduced us to this heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. And now as we kind of come into Revelation chapter 22, we kind of go a little bit more into the city. Last week, we finished up the chapter, chapter 21, and it describes some things on the inside of the city. It talked about its streets and such. But now we go in a little bit more, and it's described almost as if it's a garden, which is a wonderful thing because the whole Bible starts in a garden as God created the heavens and the earth and then placed man in the Garden of Eden. And the whole Bible will conclude itself in what is called in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, the paradise of God. In fact, uh, that is a promise. It's one of the promises of Jesus to the seven churches as he wrote that epistle to the church of Ephesus. Uh, Revelation 2, 7 says, He all who overcome will be given to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, which is a wonderful thing. And it's no doubt a reference or harking to this passage here, this final description that we have uh, in, in the Bible anyway, of eternity, of heaven and what it'll be like. And of course, we are certainly not uh, holding all of the details of heaven, right? <laughs> There's no possible way that any human language could describe eternity or what's in the spiritual realm. Uh, not in any great detail, anyhow. And so John does his best, I believe, as anointed by the Holy Spirit, uh, to grab the, the, the best words he possibly can, assemble them together for our understanding, and to give us just a tiny glimpse appear, appearing through a, a little window into heaven and eternity. And of course, as he does this, and he comes to this, this moment here, Revelation 22, we go a little further into that vision. And in fact, this is the last time we will see, and he showed me a pure river. He's coming to the final thing that he saw and that God tells him to write down, and then of course will be published and distributed abroad for all the church, for all the centuries to read and to benefit from. And so this vision comes and he sees, first of all, a river of water of life. And then, of course, the next thing he'll see is a tree of life. 
And then he's going to be given or be made aware of the fact that the curse has been lifted. And of course, we are all there serving God and reigning with him. And that's kind of like the summary of this passage. There's the water of life, a river of it. There is the tree of life. And then we see ourselves there face to face with God. He has written his, his name in our foreheads. And we are serving him there. And we are also reigning with him there, which is, it's, it's an amazing thing. But of course, water and, and foliage we have here. And so there's this paradise of God described to us. And of course, what did Jesus say to the thief on the cross? He said, today you will be with me in paradise. Of course, that's a beautiful promise because we know that even at someone's very last breath uh, of life, they can come to salvation in Christ. That God in his grace and mercy gives us every single second of our life here on earth to get right with him. He is that merciful. He is that long-suffering. In fact, some count the long-suffering and the patience of God as slackness. In other words, if God hasn't judged the world for its evil yet, then I don't think he ever will, and all things will just kind of continue as is. But we know that that is not the case. He is patient up to a point. What is that point? I have no clue. But there's a time frame within that he gives every individual a chance, an opportunity. I might say many chances, many opportunities to come to salvation in him. And if that chance is finally taken at the last breath of an individual, then they will be with Christ in paradise. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's a beautiful promise and an incredible grace to know that someone can actually live out their whole life rejecting God, and then God could, in his faithfulness, send a faithful servant to preach the gospel to somebody on their deathbed, and they could repent of their sins and accept Christ as their Savior in the very last moments and breaths and throes of life and God says, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. And so what we have here is that paradise, I believe. Uh, a description, though lacking much detail, no doubt, uh, we have some given. And so this river of water of life. I struggle when I read the commentaries because they always talk about the actual substance as water. And they describe it, many commentators describe it as the purest uh, water that anyone could ever possibly imagine, the clearest water. And of course, the language does. In fact, it's clear as crystal, right? That's, that's right out of the text. So, it, okay, fine. The physical description of this, as John saw it, was it was clear as crystal. So yes, we can, we can uh, obtain from that. It is pure, 100%. And even in our earth today, because you have to remember what, what John is seeing is in the new heavens and new earth. Uh, but even in our earth today, uh, clear water is exactly like that. It's clear and it's pure and, it's, and it's, you, can, you can drink it and it'll sustain life. You can go a while without food, but you can't go long without water at all. You need water to live. And so water does give us life indeed, uh, presently. But uh, I don't see this as H2O. <laughs> I just don't. I think this is actually a stream of eternal life. But it's described as a river because it's flowing as water flows, perhaps. And John is saying, look, I saw this stream and it was it was like it was life, but it was like river. It was flowing like water and it was coming from God's throne. And so I don't believe this is like H2O at all. I think this is actually just life. Now, I have no clue what life flowing looks like other than what's given to us here in the text, that it's clear it's pure, and it's coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. That's what the text tells us. So I think this is a, an amazing description because in the end of the day, let's remember that God, he desires life for all. That's his heart for man. That is his heart for his creation. He did not create us to die. Initially, when God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, they were a perfect specimen. They were without death or dying. Death entered when they partook of the forbidden fruit from the forbidden tree, right? And, and, and we inherit that death. That has been passed down to us. That is what's called the curse. And of course, in this text today before us, it says that the curse is no more. It's taken away. It's repealed. And then it's replaced with life. And of course, this life is coming from God 
no one else, and from nowhere else does it come but from God and his throne. And so he desires life for us. And I love this because Jesus himself said, didn't he? He said, I am come to give life and that more abundantly, didn't he? That's what he said to us. John 10.10, Jesus tells this of, of, of his desire to give life and not just, you know, survival, but thriving, that you would have life and have it more abundantly and experience it to the full. Now, it is my conviction that as long as we are in these bodies which are fallen and still part of and subject to the curse, we will struggle to fully walk in and realize that abundant life that Christ means for us to enjoy. I think we can have glimpses of it and foretastes of it, certainly. But when we get to heaven, we will literally bask in it continually, constantly, eternally, and we will truly understand what Christ meant by that abundant life that he means to give all of his children. We are hindered so much today by the world that we live in, by the flesh that we have within us, and by the devil who's, who relentlessly tempts us and accuses us before God. And so that life that Christ gives us, it is real and genuine, and we can experience it right now, but not to its full, not to its full. That will come later in eternity. Here, think about this. This life is the life of God. It cannot be anything else because it flows from him as he sits upon his throne. And in eternity, this, this river of water of life flows in an open place where all can access it. All can go to it. We can all be replenished in it. We can all be, you know, rejuvenated in it constantly and consistently. I love the fact that it talks about this as a river because when you think of a river, and of course this is an imperfect example because rivers can certainly dry up. They can certainly dry up. In fact, um, I think it was back in the 70s, I want to say, um, you guys all know the Niagara Falls, yeah, the, the incredible waterfall. It flows at an incredible rate. Niagara Mohawk River is massive. It is incredibly wide, and it is immense. And it's, it's really a wonder to see. If you ever get the chance to see it, go and see it. It's, it's really incredible. But believe it or not, there was a summer that it was so hot for so long, back in the 70s, that the thing dried up. And people were walking out on the riverbed, collecting ancient Indian artifacts that were found there on the riverbed. So it's, you know, even presently, rivers can dry up. I mean, and, and when I'm talking about rivers, I mean like, you know, something that really clearly is flowing, not like the aura, right? <laughs> so, so sometimes we look at the outer, wait, is it going the wrong direction today? What's going on? It's like, it's just still and uh, silty. But, you know, every river has a source. Every river has its water's head. It has a place where it starts. And typically this, obviously, you know, you know the, the higher water is up on a mountain and there's, there's snow-capped mountains, not so much in Finland, but nevertheless, water always goes from up to down because of gravity. Uh, but that snow will melt and tributaries will carry that snow in liquid form down to larger tributaries, which eventually will go into a river, which then eventually over some some even thousands of miles will end up in a sea uh, or an ocean somewhere, and which is called the end of a river, which is called the mouth of the river, right? And, and we have this whole hydrologic system, and rain will then evaporate uh, the water from the sea, from the, from which the you know the water comes from, from the mouth of the river, and it'll carry it back up to that mountain and dump it there again in snow, and the whole thing starts over again, right? And that's why it's called a cycle because it repeats itself. But think of this water, this, this water of life in eternity. It, it has no hydrologic system that's needed. It doesn't need some kind of outside source of help, the sun, as it were, to evaporate it from wherever it flows to, to bring it back to the throne of God so that God's throne could be replenished with enough of this life-giving water to then flow it out again. No, not at all. I, I love this picture of a river because river is constantly, consistently, persistently gushing and flowing 
forth the water. Even presently, we can see that as an example in the rivers that are on earth, but in eternity for sure, because this water is not coming from some you know, melted snow and tributaries down to streams, down to a river, and then having to restart the cycle all over. It's coming straight from God himself. And he, this almighty and powerful creator God, the one who is indeed life. In fact, in, in 1 John, he calls God, he says God is life there. The one who is life, he is flowing out his own life from his very throne for all in heaven, for all eternity to enjoy and to be replenished by. Now, I don't know about you, but that's amazing. Some mornings, you know, I wake up and I, I, I have a cup of coffee usually first thing because that's what I need to do. Uh, it, 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 you wouldn't want to talk to me otherwise. <laughs> you hardly want to talk to me after. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, much worse before my first cup of coffee. But imagine just walking up to this stream and dipping in a cup and just drinking deep of the life of God. You know, I, I, in so many ways, we, we, we can draw so many types and shadows and examples or pictures from this. Because in, indeed, even presently, you know, in a spiritual sense, in a metaphorical sense, we can, we can gain encouragement from this literal image that John is seeing, this literal sight that he is describing to us. Because every day and every morning, just as I go to make my coffee, I should also be eager to sit before God and to drink from him and to take of his life. That's how we should be starting our days. You know, as I was thinking about the power that's exuded from the throne of God to cause this river of life to flow for all eternity and never ever dry up, I was just in awe just thinking about it. And I thought to myself, you know what? What I need to say to the people is this, right now, today, and every day of your life, not just in eternity, but right now and today and every day of our lives, let's go to him who is all powerful and give us life. That's the encouragement that we can draw from this presently. But this pure river of water of life, we can see also a type of this at the cross. I, I think this is pretty interesting because when we think of the life of God, we derive our spiritual life from Christ. We are outside of Christ, we are spiritually dead. That's what the scriptures tell us. Outside of Christ, we are dead spiritually. In Christ, he has quickened us and made us alive because he has given us his life. But that life was poured out where? It was poured out at Calvary. He gave his life so that we could live, right? And when he was giving his life on Calvary and he was bleeding out his life's blood, before he no, it was just after he died and before he was taken down from the cross, but it was after he died, a soldier walked up to him because he was in shock at how fast he died. So just to make sure that he was actually dead, what did he do? He speared him and he speared him directly in his heart. And what came forth? Blood and water came forth. And I believe that's, that is a, a, a type of what God is saying, your, your eternal life, the life-giving source is me. It's flowing from me, and it's flowing from my heart to you. I wish to give you life. That from Christ's heart, not only came blood, but also water. That was not just merely a, a, a medical phenomenon. That was, that was telling something to us. Jesus was trying to tell everyone in his earthly ministry of this life which he can give and he alone can give. In fact, concerning his own life, he said, no man takes my life, I lay it down, and I will take it up again, because he is life himself. So he tried to tell the people, especially we remember the woman at the well, right, who is going there to this well every day, drawing her water up, and he told her, if you were to ask me to give you water, you would never thirst again. And she said, well, where are you going to get this water? You don't even have a bucket. And, and so he had to explain to her, I don't mean this water. I have water that you know not of, but if you were to take it from me, if you were to drink of the water that I can give you, you would never thirst again. Because he was speaking of something spiritual, something that is otherworldly, something that is outside of what we can touch and, and feel and, and taste and experience in this life, it was something deeper, something higher, something that we all need that only he can give. And he's saying, I'm willing to give it. 
I bled it forth from my heart to communicate it so loudly that I want to give you this life. He stood on the steps uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles, the closing of that ceremony at the temple, and he proclaimed in John chapter 7 that, again, that living water, he can give it. And as the water, even as the priest would pour out the water on the steps of the temple at the closing ceremony of that feast, he was proclaiming those words that he and he alone can give this life-giving water, this substance that only comes from him, that grants life to all that come to him and take it. He tried throughout his whole earthly ministry to call people to him who could give life. So for us today, I, I, I want to encourage every child of God in here, myself firstly and foremostly, that we remember that God is life. He is our source of life. He is the one who sustains us. That is why he said that man shall not live by, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so as a child of God, we need to be constant and consistent in our devotion to him. I don't mean devotionals. I mean our devotion. You know, we could have times of devotionals, which are great. We could have individual devotions. We could have group devotions with other believers where we read a small you know, portion of the Bible. We could pray together. We could have family devotions. Those are all fine, and we, we should ho hopefully all be having time. But really, a life devoted to him, a life devoted to worshiping and serving him constantly, consistently, daily, weekly, monthly, and annually. And because it's from him that we get our life. If you're low on life, listen, my encouragement to you today is to go to him. Go to him today. This is your opportunity. Right here and right now, as we wrap things up, as we come to the end of our time in God's word, as we go into communion service, and then we close in a, a worship song, take this time to really cry out to him and say, Lord, I need the life that only you can give me. You know, see, the, the problem with us is this. I think that Christians uh, too often, we too often seek refreshment, seek help, seek counsel, whatever, seek life from one another and even from people outside of the church rather than firstly and foremostly going straight to God, who is our life. I think this is such, um, I, I think it's a ploy of the devil, that he, he, he trips us up and he gets us to think that we need a man. If there's any man that we need, we need the God-man, Jesus Christ. Okay, now, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I am not saying that we can't go to one another for counsel because there is safety in a multitude of counselors. That's a biblical principle. I'm not saying that we can't go to one another for prayer. I'm not saying those things. But our heart must always be turned upward to God because even our brothers and sisters might give us bad counsel. And, and we need to have our heart always turned upward to God. Our, our sight always, our gaze must always be fixed on Him. So, so lift your eyes up to His and see His eyes looking down to you and realize His eyes, His gaze, His look towards you is one of favor, that God is favorably disposed toward you and toward me. That when we know we're in a time of trouble, a time of need, a time of desperation, a time of weakness, we know that we can't derive life. And by the way, it's unfair for me to put that burden on any one of you. That I would come to you saying, give me life. Help me. Solve my problem. That's unfair. I have a God who is greater than you. But please, you know what? Pray for me as I go through this challenge. I know God is faithful, but I'm struggling to see it. I'm struggling to realize it. So would you just please pray with me and, and pray for me? But I can't expect any one of you to lift the burden from my life, to heal anything that I need healing for on the inside. I can't do that. that only God can do that. So I'm not going to put that burden on you. I'm going to put it on God where it belongs. And he who is life and can give life, he will sort it out in his perfect time and in his right way. So we need to go to him. 
each and every day. And if you haven't gone to him, if you aren't his child yet, listen, the first thing you need to realize is you're spiritually dead. Like, you, you don't even have a little life. You know, I just read a, 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 a funny story, as many of these funny stories exist, uh, where a man arrived at the pearly gates of heaven, and guess who was at the door? Peter, right? I don't know where the other apostles are. But uh, Peter's always at the door at the pearly gates or something for, for some weird reason. And the man said, okay, I'm, I'm here. You know, how can I get in? And, and Peter said, okay, let's see how you add up. You need 1,000 points to get in. I said, okay, so what good deeds have you done? The man started saying, well, I was married for 50 years and never cheated on my wife, not even lusted after another woman in my heart and mind. Peter says, okay, that's three points. So. Oh. Uh, what else have you done? Well, I went to church faithfully my whole life since child, and I read the Bible daily, and I prayed daily. Okay, that's another point. Man's like, what are we up to now? He's like, you're up to four. He's like, oh my goodness. He's like, well, I, I worked in soup kitchens, and I fed the homeless and the poor, and I did this faithfully and devotedly ever since I became a Christian till the day I passed away and am standing before you right now. And Peter said, that's another point. And the man said, man, I... I I better just go away because I, 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 don't, know, I don't know what to do. I, I would need grace to get in. And Peter said, that's it. You need God's grace, 1,000 points. That's, that's what you need. You need God's grace. But, but I, 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 that last point, the last point, I just want to say this, aside from that last point, the 1,000 points thing, is this. That man, if, if you need to see yourself, if you are not in Christ, you are dead. It is exactly like that. You can think that your good deeds are going to bribe God? Never. You could stack them up as high as you want, and they will just be a molehill compared to what's required. You can be faithful in service to God your whole life. You could, you could never remember a day in your life where you, you didn't believe in Jesus and, and never remember a day in your life where you didn't walk and live for him and still you don't add up. Only he can give you the life that's required. Only he can quicken you who are dead in trespasses and sins and make you alive spiritually. And it's grace. We are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God. And all who are in heaven partaking of this river of life know that we partake of this because of the grace that flowed from Emmanuel's veins, because of the grace that flowed from his heart as it was depicted on the cross of Calvary for us. We could look back and remember, oh Lord, you desire life for us for all eternity. And of course, this water of life, it was clear as a crystal, is proceeding out of the throne of God. Notice, not, uh, not just the throne of God, but also the throne of the Lamb. God the Father and God the Son are one. We've dealt with this. It also repeats that same phrase in verse 3. We know that Jesus is indeed God, according to the Scriptures. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life as well which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So now you have the tree of life. There's the water of life, and now there's the tree of life. So the tree of life is described in a very interesting way. And again, just like the colors of the precious stones that we read about in the closing passages of Revelation 21, every commentator you read has a different listing of colors and different variations of order and all that. Because the best we can do is, with sanctified speculation, imagine these things. We, we don't really understand. And, and really, the way that John writes this, uh, especially if you have modern translation compared to mine, it sounds, they sound different. W what is being described here? In the midst of the street of it. Are we talking about the streets of heaven or are we talking about the pathway of the river? Because that word street can be translated pathway. So are we talking about in the midst of the pathway or the flow of this river of water of life? What are we talking about here? Or is it a street that the river of life seems to be straddling on either side and the street goes down the middle of it? You can read the commentaries and they all de describe this thing slightly differently. Here, here's, here's my understanding of it. I think that this is describing the river in the midst of the river's flow and 
on either side of the river. So we're talking about however wide this river is, this tree, it's, it's in the middle of it, and it's also straddling it, and this river flows straight through it. Now, that's not too hard for me as an American to kind of accept, uh, in my imagination anyhow. Because even presently, there's trees large enough in America which we drive our cars through. And you can experience that. If you want to go and see the, the giant redwoods and the sequoias in especially the Pacific Northwest, they're massive in California as well. They have carved out trees that you can actually pave and a road through and drive a car through. Uh, so it's not in, incredibly uh, difficult for me to think that in eternity, where everything is miraculous and everything is beyond what we could possibly imagine, that God could make a tree to be there in the middle of a flowing river and also at the same time on both sides of with this river going straight through it. Uh, so I just see this as incredibly immense. Some feel that this is actually even describing a tree which like an aspen, which I think is, I think in Finnish is hapa, I think it is, um, aspen trees, they grow from the root the roots sprout up more trees. They also can grow from seeds planted, but mostly they pro proliferate uh, from root sprouts from under the earth, but it's all from one tree. So one could say it's one tree that sprouts up in many places all along this river. That some feel that this could be what's being described here. As it goes down the sides of the river, this tree is there everywhere. As it sprouts up, new shoots going up, and the trunks are growing and such, and bearing fruit and whatever. However it is, uh, I, I'm not sure. But we know that there is a tree of life, right? Now, the last time you saw a tree of life, guess where it was? In the Garden of Eden. All the way back in the very first days of man. First days of man's existence. And the tree of life was there, and also the tree of knowledge of good and evil was there. One was prohibited, which was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And, you know, one was stationed there to represent life, the life of God. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, God, in Revelation, or Genesis, excuse me, chapter 3, he barred the way to the tree of life. And he said specifically why, so that man won't live forever, lest he take of the tree of life and eat of its fruit and live forever. He said, we're going to station cherubims at the, at the entering in of the way and a flaming sword. First time that we have any reference of fire in the Bible is there. A flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life. This is in Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 through 24, I believe. You guys can go check it out on your own. This has been the, the, the tree of life barred from creation, right? Because man fell. The curse entered the world, thereby death entered the world. Now man is thinking, well, there's this other tree in the garden. Maybe I can go partake of it. And God says, no, because if you partake of the tree of life now in a fallen, sinful, cursed state, you will perpetually exist in that state. So I am going to bar you from eating of the fruit of the tree of life. And he barred them. Now that tree of life stood there, we presume, up until the day of the flood and the floods, when the flood waters came, the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the firmament above the earth was let go and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights upon the heads of all living creatures on earth and it covered the whole entire world, the global flood, and it was global. Anybody that wants to try to say the Bible doesn't talk about a global flood, you're not reading the Bible, not the Bible that I read anyway. It's very clear. It's a global flood. Um, and, and so there, there's this global flood and catastrophe, and the tree is no longer to be found after the flood, right? It's, it's no longer present. Some think, and I'm not sure I agree with this. I think it's a little far-fetched, but some do believe that the tree of life was taken up to God and preserved until this time, until the eternal state where we will be to then actually benefit from it. I don't know if that's the case. Either way, if, if the old tree of life was done away with and, you know, whatever, that's, that's between God and his own eternal counsels and he creates a new tree of life, which I kind of lean towards because we are told in the new heavens and new earth, all is become new. 
So this would then tell me that this is a new tree of life that God has in the eternal state. But notice what he puts it there for. It's yielding fruits, it's bearing fruits, and it's yielding fruits, and it yields fruits every month, multiple different kinds of fruits, 12 to be exact, right? Which 12, by the way, if you do a study on your own, about 12 through chapters 21 and 22, you will find the number 12 repeatedly uh, mentioned. It's, it's quite interesting. I don't think those are by accident. I'm not sure I know the meaning, but I, I, I don't think God does those things by accident. But here there are 12 kinds of fruit, manners of fruit, and they are yielded each and every month. Now, this, this brings up a question. Because of the mention of month, is there time in eternity? Right? Well, again, I think John is doing the best he can with his understanding of language to describe something that he's seen in the eternal. Uh, I think what he's seen is a, a perpetual harvest going on and no winter, no time of, you know, uh, sowing, no time of waiting for the harvest to come. It's just always a harvest in heaven. You don't need to do anything to make it happen. It's just always bearing forth fruit. And then it specifically says that the leaves of this tree are for the healing of the nations. Now, this word healing is where we get our English word therapeutic from or therapy from. It is therapeia in Greek. And it is not to say that there is something sick in heaven that needs healing or something that is, you know, gone wrong with somebody in heaven. And if something goes wrong in heaven with somebody's health, they can go and eat of this leaf from the tree of life and then they would be cured. No, because there's not going to be any kind of breakdown of any kind of health in heaven. That's, that's here and now. Here and now we experience entropy and the breaking down of our bodies and needing healing and needing medicine to heal us. But also here and now we experience therapeutics, don't we? I mean, if you take vitamins, that is a therapeutic way to maintain what is already healthy. And that's the idea here. God is wanting to maintain that constant center of help, health rather, uh, for everyone, for all eternity. And so these leaves seem to kind of offer that therapeutic for us throughout eternity. I, 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 don't, I don't know what else to make of it but that. Uh, and so this tree is offering health. It's offering food, not healing health, but therapeutic health. It's offering food. Yes, we will eat in heaven. Jesus, in his resurrected form, he partook of food. That's an interesting concept. Uh, he, he talked of, of banqueting and feasting with his believers in heaven, and you will not pay for it, money or in other ways, <laughs> right? You can, you can just, you can eat for the sheer enjoyment of eating. And you want to eat? Yeah, let's go eat. Are you hungry? No, but I'd like to eat. I mean, right? And, and what, what kind of fruit is going to be coming from this tree? We have no clue. Uh, but think of the fruit that you enjoy the most. Um, I don't know. Some, some enjoy maybe peaches. Imagine if it was like one of, the, one of the fruits on this tree was a peach, but it's like no other peach you've ever tasted in your life. That the peaches that you know are under the curse, and they're also genetically modified. <laughs> I mean, they, they talk about organic and locally grown, right? <laughs> locally sourced food. We're going to have it right from the source that everything God produces in heaven is only going to offer more life. And again, we have the water of life. We have the tree of life. God desires life for us. That's his heart for us. And in verse 3, it goes on to get better. There is going to be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. No more curse. Again, the curse entered at the fall of Adam and Eve when they partook of the forbidden tree, right? And ever since, we've inherited that curse. If you were born a natural birth, which you were, because <laughs> only Christ wasn't, then you have inherited a sinful nature from your parents. It is called original sin. It is passed down throughout all generations of humanity. Throughout every single human being, it's been passed down to the next generation until you and me today. And yes, 
That includes your little precious babies that you guys carry here to church that you love and cherish so much and know that they could do no wrong and all that. Oh, believe me, there's a sinful nature in there. It'll rear its ugly head soon enough. You'll see it. You'll see it soon enough. It's there. They've inherited it. No child needs to be taught to lie. No child needs to be taught that, you know, to be selfish, right? But you have to correct those things. You have to implement corrective measures for those kind of behaviors because they just, they just come out because it's, 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 we've inherited it. It's a sinful nature. That's part of the curse. And, and the curse also has brought death, right? Suffering, anguish, heartache, not just the kind of you know, suffering that we think of physical ailments, but also the mental illnesses that we face. That's all part of the curse. We could just say our bodies and our beings are not right. They're not the way that God intended them to be. They really aren't. So, so even as Christians, you have to understand your body is still under the curse. And you still will feel the effects of the curse in that way. And there will be a constant wrestling. The spirit wrestles against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. Paul tells us we are under the curse presently. Though you are saved, you still experience the results of the curse each and every day. As a child of God, you will one day be delivered from the very experience of the curse itself. Because it tells us here that the curse will be no more. You guys should go and do a search on your own, Revelation 21 and 22, all of the things that will not be in heaven. It's a very important and, I think, curious study for you to do on your own. I've done it myself. We don't have time to go through all the lists here, but here is one of those things. There will be no more curse. No more curse. So what's interesting about this is the Bible, right? It opens, it opens really good because it opens with God, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? That's how the Bible opens. So you can't say it opened bad. It opened really good because it was all about God and what he did. But man, did things go downhill quickly after that. And from the moment that Adam and Eve sinned against God, there's been this curse, right? And God pronounced it in Genesis chapter 3. He pronounced it very clearly against the serpent, against Eve, and against Adam specifically. He lays it all out. He says, man, the serpent, you're cursed amongst all the animals and cattle. You're, you're going to crawl on your belly. He curses the serpent. He curses Eve and said, you will have pain and sorrow and childbearing, and you will strive with man. And he curses man, saying that your work, you will, you will earn your way in life through pain and suffering. It's all part of the curse, right? You go through to the Old Testament, and, and through the Old Testament, you get to the law of Moses. And under the law of Moses, right, if you do not obey the laws, there is the threat of curse being pronounced upon you. Deuteronomy chapter 27. If you don't obey the law of God, you will be cursed. Go all the way to the end of the Old Testament. Malachi, the last verse of the Old Testament, the last phrase of the Old Testament ends like this. Lest I come and smite the land with a curse. Isn't that crazy? The Old Testament started so well, but man, it finished on a curse. But you turn the page from Malachi, Malachi to Matthew, and Matthew 1.1 1, 1 starts with Jesus Christ. And Revelation chapter 22, verse 22, ends with Jesus Christ. And he has reversed the curse because of what he did on the cross of Calvary. And so the Old Testament... It, it, it does. Yes, there's glorious promises there in the Old Testament. I don't want to just speak generally as such over the Old Testament, but, but concerning the rebellion of man and God's curse that had entered the world because of the rebellion of man, the Old Testament represents that so clearly in the way that it starts and ends. But when you look at the New Testament and what God did in sending his only son to reverse the curse, to repeal it, and replace it with eternal blessings in his son, Jesus Christ. Such a powerful thing, such an incredible thing, just even in how God laid out his Bible for us. He shows us that I mean to give you life. I want to remove this which causes death. It will not exist in heaven. Notice this as well. Look at how verse 3 ends. 
His servants shall serve him. In heaven, you will have tasks. I will have tasks. But remember what I just said. Remember what I just said. The curse is no more. Part of the curse that God pronounced specifically upon Adam was that the labor of his hands and his life would be heavy and toilsome. And man, it's going to wear him down and break his body. And his service then before God was flawed at best. Ours right now, our service before God is flawed. You and I will never realize the full potential in the hand of God and what he can use us to accomplish until we get to heaven and serve him there without the curse getting in the way. Because even at our best of days in service to God, our service is still flawed because we're under the curse. But in heaven, our service even will be perfected. And we will go on serving him. You know, some people think that heaven's just a place of constant rest. And it is that because, as I already said, God gave us a tree of life, right? And the tree of life provides all that we need for sustenance, if we're going to need sustenance at all, because we're going to be in resurrected form. So you don't need to labor for your sustenance. You don't need to labor to make money to pay the bills and, you know, you got to contact the electric company because you're late and, you know, got to contact the car loan and say, I'm, I can't pay this month. And there's going to be none of that, right? Everything's provided for. So in that sense, man, there's rest. There's peace. Everything's just done. Done. There's rest. Yes. But it doesn't mean that you're going to do nothing. God's going to let us be part of serving him. And I said it like that on purpose. He's going to let us. It's going to be a high and holy privilege, just as it is now, to serve him. That's why we sing that song, right? That at his feet is the most high place. We sing that because we realize that in service to God, you know, Lord, all that you've done for me, that you've given your son, Jesus Christ, as my propitiation, the one who was perfect and spotless and holy gave his life for me who was a sinning wretch, so undeserving, and you saved me and gave me eternal life and promised me a place in this glorious bliss that's described to us in Revelation. And then Paul says, Therefore I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, offer yourselves as living sacrifices because it is only your reasonable service that you do so. Now it makes sense because of all that he has done. He's withheld nothing from me. How can't I but give him all that I am in service to him? And that's my privilege to do so, that he would even accept any service that I would render to him and for his glory as worthwhile. It's a grace all by itself. And for all eternity, we will have this opportunity in perfection to serve him with no wrong motives, with no bad attitude, you know, because I know that you guys don't struggle with that, but I struggle with serving the Lord sometimes with the right heart. You know, sometimes when I come into church and I see certain things the way they are, I get like, mm. and then I go and do it. And the Lord's saying, why are you doing it like that, Bob? What do you mean like that, Lord? I'm getting it done. No, I mean like that in your heart. Why do you have that attitude? I've just given you another blessed opportunity to serve me. Don't you feel it a privilege? Don't you sense it a joy? Oh, Lord, forgive me. And he reminds us. He, he corrects our perspective again, and, and, and then we can kind of go off in joyful service to him. But man, he doesn't just care about what you do. He cares about how you do it. It is, it is, it is so important that we understand that. There's, there's people that are... Uh, they're, let's just say they're very loud voices uh, that are speaking into um, the Christian world in America. And I don't want to name any names, but they, 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 they say that your doing is what matters more than your thinking to God. And I, I think that is so flawed. Jesus came and he said that you have, you have heard that it has been said you shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you that if you've just looked upon a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. So he does care about our thoughts. He does care about the inner man. He, not just what we do. That does matter to God for sure. But how we do it. 
right? Because I can abstain from all sorts of bad behaviors, but if it's there in my heart, what good is that? God sees it, and it's filthy to him altogether, whatever it might be, anger, wrath, malice, envy, strife, just any, any of those attitudes that God says, no, th- this, is, this is not meant to be in you. I want to correct you. I want to remove that from you. I want to free you from that because, man, what a dark cloud to live under. And I want to let you serve me with joy. And this is what it's going to be like in heaven, that we will serve him with gladness and with joy perpetually in our heart and perfectly. And then it says in verse 4, and they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. Again, seeing God's face, you know, we, we, I'm sure that somebody has thought of or, or said along the way that why didn't John describe this sight that he saw of God? You know, or, or was it just told to him that, you know, and, and by the way, not for you now, John, but, you know, when you get here, you will see the face of God. I mean, what will seeing the face of Almighty God be like. It's, it's unimaginable. That's why this whole thing, as we consider it, we realize that what Paul told us in Corinthians is true, that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. We can't imagine it. But this really speaks of having free and open and clear, unhindered fellowship and communion with God. That's really what this speaks to. And and you know what this is like. There's going to be no medium in between us. You know when you have, um, when you're communicating with a friend and maybe the conversation goes into a a, a difficult topic and you're trying to do it through texting? You know what I'm saying? You're like, you know what, can we just wait to see each other? I'd I'd really prefer to talk about this in person because I I like the feel of the room. I like the, the... the micro expressions of the face to know, like, are, are they understanding or, or am I misunderstood here? Or what's going to happen? And, you know, all these things. When you send a text message, sometimes it can be totally misunderstood, even though what was said needed to be said. But it wasn't really received as it was meant to be received, right? Because there's something in between you and the other individual. Right now, that's, that's what we deal with. There's nothing in between us and God by way of our sin or, or anything like that. That, that. that gap has been bridged in Christ. We are one with him for sure. But again, we're hindered because God is veiled. He's veiled to us. We don't see him like this. But one day we will. And you know what? You're not going to cower. You're not going to crawl and grovel before him in fear. You're going to be free and open and clear Because it's going to be him and his love and his life and his glory. And all of it is just going to feel good. None of it's going to make you feel shameful or guilty because your sin's been dealt with in Christ. And then it says on on our foreheads will be his name. Um, For those who try to argue for uh, tattoos being okay with God, some have actually used this this verse and verses similar. Ah, well, you know, I leave that between you and the Lord. You know, we're, we're, you have to walk within the freedom and the conscience that you have before God on your own. That's fine. I personally don't have qualms with that, but I don't have any tattoos, but I don't think it to be sinful or not. You have to pray about it. You have to pray about it because the Bible doesn't say anything as clear as such. But some like to use this as a justification. I think this is just simply to say that we will have a perfect resemblance of him. He's going to put himself there, right on our forehead. The forehead speaks of something that's right before your eyes. He's going to be there all the time, his name. Nothing will distract us from him, in other words. Perfect resemblance. And then in verse 5, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Think of the two things we just saw here. They almost seem contradictory, don't they? We just read about us serving him, but now it's saying we're going to reign with him. Well, which one is it? Yes, it's both. We're going to serve him, and we will reign with him. I love how Paul describes this. He says in Romans chapter 8, he says in verse 16, the spirit itself 
bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if we are children, then we are also heirs, heirs of God. Listen, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So we are joint heirs with Christ. All that the Lord will rule and reign over in his grace, in his infinite mercy, as we can't possibly begin to understand it, he has allowed us to enter into that as well and rule and reign together with him. I, I can't believe it as I say it, in fact, but that's what the scriptures tell me. So I accept it. I accept it as true. We will rule and reign with him. We will reign, as, as it says here, forever and ever. By the way, there's nothing new under the sun but perhaps the Bible is the first book that has given us that, that whole concept of servant leadership, right? Because here you have, of course, the perfect example is Christ. But here you have those two, the two sides of the coin, don't you? You have serving him and you have reigning with him forever and ever. So servant leadership, it's a biblical concept. We are to lead by serving. That's the idea. So may the Lord help us. May he grant to us just hope in him. And may he inspire us to seek him for life, the life that we need to live each and every day for him. In Peter, it tells us that all things pertaining to life and godliness are bound up in knowing Christ. So let us each and every day have the heart to seek after him. It's not something that we can generate within ourselves. But we go to him in prayer and say, Lord, you know what? Lately, I've been not really desiring your word, not really desiring to pray. I've not really been desiring even to be in fellowship with other saints. Lord, change this in me and, and, and help me to grow. And, and Lord, restore in me the joy of thy salvation that I might seek after you. Even as the deer pants after the water brook, so my soul longeth after thee. That's how we should be. And then we will have his life and, and be able to partake in a, in a kind of a foretaste manner that abundant life that Christ means for us to ultimately live freely and fully in, in eternity. Amen? Amen. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. And, uh, and then I guess you're going to sit right back down because they're going to pass out the communion elements. But Lord, we thank you for this time in your word. And I do pray now as we come before you to just remember the reason why we are able to expect all that we read of in Revelation and to look forward to it is because of all that you've done for us on Calvary, Jesus. And because you have died and rose again and you've offered eternal life to any who repent of their sins and place their faith in you, Lord, we know that we can enter into these promises by faith now, but one day and for eternity, even by sight and experience. Lord, we, we thank you so much, Lord, for your grace which saves. We thank you, Jesus, that you gave us multiple chances in our lifetime before your spirit finally broke the hardness of our hearts and before your spirit ultimately drew us and led us to the Messiah, to you, Jesus. We thank you so much for sending your Holy Spirit to convict us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come and to show us that the only way to heaven, the only way to have our sins cleansed is through your shed blood, Lord. And we thank you that you and you alone can give life and that you desire to give it. So we come to you now and we ask, Lord, shower us, bathe us, fill us, overflow us with your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated and